and it's good to acknowledge the graduations as you did and uh, it's good just to see a lot of a lot of activity uh, i want to mention a couple of things now greg made uh, craig rather made one mistake in his announcements he says that's the end of the announcements and he didn't realize who was coming into the platform because every time i come here i have my long list of announcements to give and uh, these are all different things that we're involved with but uh, will have an impact on you folks uh, what Jerry said is true, and of course, Jerry and Marilyn, we see them all the time, and Phil and Mary all the time with our luncheons and other things. But, uh, you know, on Sunday, this is next Sunday, you're going to have your uh, series at the boardwalk, right? Your, not series, but your meetings. Uh, I've spoken on that Sunday many a time, and uh, this year I asked not to do that. I have a different Sunday. But uh, the warning is, should be heated because it's the choir festival night at Ocean Grove. And with Choir Festival, spots get taken quickly. So be sure you're there on time, right? Because that's uh, as much needed as parking spaces come at a premium. And I noticed I was there last night. I caught the concert last night, the patriotic concert at the Great Auditorium. And uh, they're doing some construction there in the uh, south parking lot, which means a lot of those spaces are not available because all the construction equipment is in there and fencing and all that sort of thing. So uh, I'll be there. I'm looking forward. As a matter of fact, the bus that we have parked outside these buildings will be packed with people. And we'll be at the Belmar service, so we won't be throwing tomatoes. I know that we won't be doing that, but uh, we will be there cheering you on and praying for the Lord's blessing in your meetings. So um, we're looking forward to that next Lord's Day uh, at four o'clock. Uh, it was also mentioned about the Pilgrim's Progress uh, presentation. That's a mouthful uh, with alliteration right there, but that will be taking place at our meeting down at Bethany on Thursday evening, like Craig said, July 13th, Thursday at seven o'clock, but also at Ocean Grove and it's in the Tabernacle, just like Craig said, the great auditorium is that big 10,000 seat, it'd be great to have it in there, but uh, they have their, basically their performances in that Tabernacle, it's called the Tabernacle, which is right next to it, to the left of it, as you look straight on. That is done and performed by the summer team for the Academy of Arts. Uh, the Academy of Arts is down near the Greenville, South Carolina area. Taylor, uh, Taylor's is where it's specifically from. And uh, just last year, uh, the Academy of Arts made a contract with the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC. And uh, so the team that's coming and the whole uh, Academy that's doing this performance is the same group that has done this in the Museum of the Bible. That's a big thing. They do a very professional job. You'll be blessed if you see that. If you can't make it Friday, come to see us at Bethany, uh, same time, seven o'clock on that Thursday, but uh, if you can make it over to the Tabernacle there in Ocean Grove at seven o'clock on that Friday night, you'll be blessed. So I hope you can make it. They do a very, very professional job, a sight and sound type quality program that they do. So we hope that you can join and it's free of charge, no cost. That's the best part of it, right? No cost. So that's a good thing. Now also, it looks like you have a pretty busy week. You got Thursday with that focus on the family video. That's great. You have some other things taking place, but not tonight, not tonight because it's 4th of July. Well, that's caused me to remember that we uh, have sponsored this fellow by the name of Walter Santos to come to Ocean Grove on Tuesday night, which is 4th of July. And uh, Walter Santos uh, is a musician, Christian musician, who goes around having concerts on what he calls gospel doo-wop. And what this means is that he takes music from the past and alters the words of it. He's got a license to do that. He's allowed to do that. And uh, he will have a concert there at the Boardwalk Pavilion on uh, Tuesday evening at uh, seven o'clock right there at Ocean Grove. I have a little flyer right here so I can leave it with someone here and they can post it if they'd like to. That's at seven o'clock. Uh, uh, Walter was uh, a heroin addict and he actually flatlined on, which means uh, looked like he was, had died and he was resuscitated and came back. He was led to the Lord by Dion DiMucci. Dion DiMucci became a Christian after his fame in the uh, teeny bopper uh, genre, uh, The Wanderer and Run Around Sue and all these people, all these songs done back in the 50s and 60s. Well, that person became a Christian and then led Walter Santos to the Lord. He's got a tremendous testimony. So if you're available on Tuesday night, right at Ocean Grove at seven o'clock at the Boardwalk Pavilion, you can hear more of his testimony. He sings these songs and a lot of hymns. So we hope you can make it. Once again, that's a free concert. So two events that are free, that's great. 
We always like that. And uh, in your, uh, on your bulletin board, you probably have this information already, but we have our conferences. We have one this week at Ocean Grove for the week. We also have one at Harvey Cedars on a weekend of September, September 8th through 10th, with Mark Swaim as the uh, teacher for that weekend. And then Brian Gunning is the teacher for a week long, goes from Sunday to Thursday. And that information is right here on these flyers. So I'll leave them all with you and uh, you can look and get more details uh, on the bulletin board in the back. Okay, so that wasn't the end of the announcements like Craig erroneously said. Uh, I had some more to add to it. Okay, let me share my screen and I'd like to have you turn your Bible, give you enough time to turn your Bibles to the book of Jonah. If you're a visitor with us today, the book of Jonah is found on 1067, page 1067 in your pew Bible. 1067 in the pew Bible, but the book of Jonah is one of those minor prophets. It's about five minor prophets away from the book of Daniel, so you can find it by uh, going there. So I, like everyone else on a spare moment, was just looking at my phone. And as you know, the headlines on phones, when we have these days, we live by these phones, right? The banking's done on it and the emails are done on it and everything else is done on these phones, all right there in the phone. And I see this announcement saying a whale had swallowed two men off the Jersey coast. Did you hear that announcement? Maybe didn't it? didn't swallow them whole, he, he, he took them, the whale took these two in and spit them right out. He didn't swallow them all the way down. Just happened here. So the next day I read in the announcement about whales coming to shore over at Spring Lake. I said, wow, we, that gives me inspiration for a message, the book of Jonah. <laughs> well, lest you think that it's not the spirit guiding us and it's the, the headlines, I was thinking through this book, the book of Jonah, I thought this might be a great challenging exhortation for all of us to consider some of the spiritual lessons that come from the life and ministry of this very, very interesting prophet. Now I've spoken long enough, hopefully you found the book of Jonah. It's only a couple chapters long, but uh, it's a great story, great account. I'd like to read chapter one of this, this great epistle or account, I should say more than epistle. Jonah chapter one, verse one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. And the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God through the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. And now at verse six. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And so he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. Verse 12, and he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. 
And God will certainly bless the reading of his word and obedience to it as well. You know, it says in Isaiah chapter 55, it'll accomplish that which he pleases and it won't come back void in any way. Well, of all the books in the Bible, perhaps the book of Jonah is the one that's most discredited by the critics of the Bible. They say, how in the world can a whale swallow a man? And even though whales are constructed in such a way, it's hard to do that. It's a King James version in Matthew chapter 12 that tells us the whale, but really it's translated a great fish. And there is on record that there are larger fish and even some sharks, we think of sharks as being very aggressive, but some sharks have been on record, have swallowed horses, full horses. They were able to uh, dissect the shark and find a whole horse inside the belly of a very large shark. And so uh, that is a possibility. But regardless, this is the word of God that we've read. And the word of God tells us this, th these things took place. And so some have questioned whether or not this is a really a reliable book. Is this allegory or is this a, par a parable? And that's the question that often comes. But consider these words from uh, the uh, Lord Jesus there in Matthew chapter 12. I don't know if you can see the whole uh, verse or not. The reference yes, yeah. you can't okay i can't on mine but uh it says the men of nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation condemn it because they repented at the preaching of jonah indeed a greater than jonah is here and of course the lord jesus was speaking about himself so the book of jonah has a veracity to it a truthfulness to it because of the words of the lord jesus he said a greater than jonah is here no question about it he says the men of nineveh will rise up and condemn the generation that he was in because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, but this generation that he was referring to uh, didn't show any evidence of repentance at all. Well, that's one truth about the uh, historicity of this person called Jonah. But another one is found in 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 22. And uh, in that, it refers to a person or a king by the name of Jeroboam, Jeroboam II, one of the kings of Israel. And uh, he was used, even though he wasn't a great king. He was one of those bad kings in the nation of Israel. They had about 20 kings, and uh, in the northern part, all of them were bad. And this guy Jeroboam, though, when he was in his reign, uh, Israel was prosperous, primarily because of the preaching of Jonah. And it says in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, he, that is Jeroboam, restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hama, I think it is, in the Sea of Araba, according to the word of the Lord, uh, the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer, the northern part of Israel. So 2 Kings chapter 14 says there was this guy by the name of Jonah, and he was a prophet. And interestingly, Jonah was used in a powerful way in his early days. That was much earlier than the incidents that we read about here in the book of Jonah. And so this is a powerful truth that God can use young people in a very powerful way. And that's what happened with Jonah. God used him in a super positive, powerful way in the preaching. Now, the nation of Israel didn't turn around and become very spiritually oriented. They were strong militarily. They were strong economically, but spiritually, they were down in the depths. And so even though Jonah preached and he represented the Lord, and even though there was a positive effect upon the nation in those different departments, uh, wasn't so positive spiritually. Later on, God was going to use his servant Jonah to go become a foreign missionary to these people in the nation of Assyria. And so that brings us up to that present. Now, uh, you know, Jonah is one of those books that you can read and find some parallels in. One of them is a parallel of Christ. Because don't forget, the Lord said when he was in his earthly ministry that uh, he was... Uh, just like Jonah was in the heart of this belly's fish for three days and three nights, even so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So the very fact that this guy named Jonah was swallowed by a fish and then taken down into the bottom of the ocean and survived, and he came back and started again preaching in Nineveh, as we still see in chapter 3. It's that great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who was in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So it's a great picture of the person of Christ. But it's also a picture of the nation of Israel. Because as we read in verse uh, nine of this chapter, that Jonah, 
declared the fact. He said, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and dry land. So he acknowledged the fact that he was a Jewish person, right? No question about that. And God wanted him to go out and preach and be a witness to this nation, this nation of Assyria, who is the, let's call him the Russia of the day, the world power of the day. And yet Jonah didn't want to do that, right? He went the opposite direction. And Israel as a nation in their history, they were called to be a witness to the nations. Ezra, the book of Ezra tells us that and some other scriptures as well, Ezekiel and some others. And yet the nation of Israel rebuffed God's overtures to be a witness to the nations and got inclusive to themselves. And then that responsibility was shirked in some ways by the nation. But Romans chapter 11 and other scriptures, not just that portion, Romans chapter 11, but others, tells us that the nation of Israel will be used of God in the future, become a witness to the nations after they go through a tribulation period of seven years on earth, a really rough time on earth. God has not done with his people Israel. And he's going to bring them around and they're going to acknowledge their Messiah. Right now they are in denial of the fact that Christ has come. And so there's some great lessons prophetically, dispensationally. Those are big words just to tell us that there are some pictures that Jonah is of Christ and of the nation of Israel. So some tremendous lessons that come from this book. But as is the case, whenever I preach, I always like to bring out the practical lessons because I know you're here this morning and say, what's the preacher gonna say that's gonna help me out today on Monday morning or Tuesday morning or through the work week or the health issues I'm going through or the financial issues I'm going through or the personality issues I'm going through or whatever it might be, how can this help me out? Even in my walk with Christ, perhaps you're asking. And maybe there's someone in the audience who has never trusted Christ as savior. What's the lesson there for us? Lots of lessons from this little book uh, buried in the Old Testament that have a tremendous impact on your walk with Christ today. An ongoing witness for Christ. And in some ways, we can be just like Jonah, who is given a responsibility God spoke to, and Jonah has said, no, I'm not interested, sorry. What does that have to do with me? Do I really have to do this? And if we're really honest about it, sometimes God does speak in so many different ways. I'm not talking about audible voices from heaven. We're not talking that. We're talking about, you know, when God can impress upon you through some circumstance, through some words that somebody might even say in church, or you hear on a radio broadcast or something else, God speaking to you and telling you to do something. The example of scripture is that the servants of the Lord instantly obeyed what God said because they wanted to please the Lord. This is the only case, the book of Jonah, where a prophet got a commission from the Lord and he said, not doing it, sorry. You don't see any of that in the scriptures. I mean, Peter in uh, Acts chapter 10, when he got the vision, <clears throat> God said to him, there's a vision that came of a, of a sheet coming down from heaven with animals on it, unclean animals, according to the Jewish dietary laws, unclean and clean. And God spoke to Peter at that time and said, Peter, you know, rise, kill and eat these animals and have a meal. And Peter said, not so, Lord. I remember Peter saying that, but he said, not so, not so. And then he agreed with God. But here's a case of a person getting a commission from the Lord saying, I want you to go. And he said, uh-uh, not going to do it. I'm going to go to the opposite direction. And that's exactly what he did. He found a boat going to this place called Tarshish, which scholars say is in the south of Spain. So picture this, he's, on, he's in the, on the dry land of Israel and he's being told to go to the east. And he's right at the port city of Joppa, which today is called Jaffa. We get our, some oranges from there, you know, Jaffa oranges, right? You've seen those, those in the stores. Instead he hops on the boat and goes off the opposite direction. So some really lessons there for each one of us. So Jonah is indeed a type. He's a type of Christ and he's a type of the nation of Israel. But you know, there's more than one miracle. Everybody looks at the book of Jonah and says, wow, you know, the account of this guy being swallowed by this great fish. And it overshadows other things that take place in his book. But there's at least 10 miracles that take place in the book of Jonah. And they're not all in one chapter. But uh, the one, of course, is when the lot fell on Jonah. 
you know, when the storm came up, <clears throat> as we just got done reading, as the storm came up, there are these mariners who are seasoned professionals on the sea. You ever watch that program, Wicked Tuna? Anybody ever see that program? I watched that and I'm amazed. You know, they're out in the middle of the sea and these guys are dealing with the waves and everything else. I said, you wouldn't catch me out there. But you know, it's a frightening event, but um, you know, these are professionals, fishermen, and they're on the boat and they're going through the sea. They've seen storms before. But it says they were very much afraid. There was a tremendous fear amongst them. So even the captain is worried. And the question is, they see Jonah there. He's sleeping in the hull of the ship. And, and uh, he says to Jonah, he says, what reason is this? What's going on here? <clears throat> and so they consulted together. It says here in verse 7, come let us cast lots that we may know whose cause this trouble has come upon us. And the cause is plainly because of Jonah. God had made it that way. <clears throat> and so the lot fell on Jonah. That's a miracle. I mean, if somebody here was parked in a wrong spot out on the street, and I said, let's cast lots and see who it is. And it's Phil Parsons' car out there. And we're casting lots, and the lot falls on Phil. I would say that's a miracle because the lot fell on Phil, and Phil was guilty. That's what happened here with Jonah. It was for his disobedience that God was causing these events to come up. And when they cast lots, the lot fell on Jonah, the exact person, that's a miracle. So that's just one of many. There's another one, the sea that stopped its raging when they threw Jonah in, all of a sudden the sea, sea stopped its raging. Now the seas will stop their raging, but not when you click your fingers or throw something into the water. That's what happened with Jonah. So that's a miracle that took place. A third miracle that took place, the conversion of the mariners. Here are these hardened men, sea going men, they're talking about calling upon their God, every man to call upon their God to cause this storm to cease. And all of a sudden they're talking about the Lord and sacrificing to the Lord at the end of the chapter. And I expect to see these guys in heaven. There was a conversion that took place. Now there's more between the lines, but there was a conversion that took place here. <clears throat> the swallowing of Jonah, I mean, that. That's a miracle in itself, but the fact that he remained alive is the miracle, right? He fell into the sea, went down, didn't drown. The casting up of Jonah on the land, you know, the, the big fish could have burped him up, you know, in the middle of the ocean. That would have been the end of the story, right? But he burped him up on the beach. And so that's a miracle, right? The precise location where Jonah had to uh, then go back to uh, go, go on to Nineveh. The conversion of the inhabitants of Nineveh, which is found in chapter four, that's a tremendous miracle that takes place because that event took place uh, sometime later. And then the worm, and then the vine, and then the east wind, all these things cropped up in chapter four. We didn't read those verses, but those are all miracles that took place overnight. This vine comes up overnight, and then a worm eats at the root of it, and it comes down quickly, just like that than a vehement east wind. <clears throat> so <clears throat> one miracle after another, after another, after another. And so some critics of the Bible will look at and say, oh, this can't be, you know, this is a nice story. We pull moral lessons from it. The majority of Christendom looks at it just that way. They say, oh, let's find some nice little moral stories in here. But the Lord Jesus said himself, a greater than Jonah is here. Just like Jonah was in the fish's belly for three days and three nights, even so shall the Son of Man be three nights, days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The Lord verified it. The scripture verifies it. It doesn't matter because the word of God tells us that everything in the word is true. And that's why we uphold the scriptures. That's why we say the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword pierces to dividing asunder of soul and spirit as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That means when we open this book, the spirit of God will take these scriptures, whoever it might be, you know, 80 people, 70 people, whatever in this room, and the spirit of God will direct your attention to the particular verse that you need for today. That's why it's so important to come and come under the sound of the teaching of God's word. Well, let's take a look at Jonah, the overall outline of the book, four chapters. 
In chapter one, we have the account of the running prophet, Jodah on the run. He's the reluctant prophet overall, but he's running in chapter one. In chapter two, he's praying. He's the praying prophet. Chapter three, he's the preaching prophet as he goes into Nineveh and preaches a very brief message and says, hey, 40 days and Nineveh is going to be no more. That was his message. He wasn't on TV. He didn't have a three-piece suit. He wasn't, uh, you know, very particularly attractive, I don't think, because coming out of the fish's belly, I'm sure he was, uh, you know, the acid from the digestive juices of the fish probably bleached him. And he came rolling into town saying 40 days. I'm there probably saying, who, what nut is this with this message? And yet the townspeople came to know the Lord. So he's the preaching prophet. And then finally in chapter four, he's the complaining prophet. He's complaining about his own comforts. He had a problem with comfort in the first part of the chapter. He was disengaged from all the events that were going on. He's trying to take a nap. What's wrong with Jonah? And then he's complaining about the wind, the east wind that came up, a Sirocco, you know, these desert storms that come up. He's complaining, he's, he's thankful for the shade he gets from the tree that comes up overnight. Then he's angry again. He's like, you and me, we're fine if everything's going fine. We're very agreeable. We're very friendly. We're the best person we know in the whole world until someone crosses us, until something comes our way that we don't like. Then the flesh, like the scripture talks about, even in the life of the believer, rears its ugly head. And then we get resentful. We get bitter. Colton, are you talking about believers? Yeah, absolutely. We can be snippy. We can be impatient. We can be totally resentful of this person, that person, vengeful. We're like anybody else. The difference is we have the resource through prayer and through the help of the Holy Spirit to convict us and to say, Lord, I know that's not right. Give me the ability to overcome. Give me the ability to be more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's the difference in the Christian life. We have the resources. We have the ability to see through the problems that are going on in this world and have some insight from scripture and say, okay, this is what the Bible talks about. Second Timothy chapter three, know this that in the last days, perilous times will come. 15 different descriptions of what's gonna happen in last day society. For the believer, the one who reads the Bible, now we're not talking about the believers who don't read, we're talking about believers who study the scriptures, we're gonna have an insight into world events and what's taking place as God moves things around according to his purposes. And that's what's happening here in the book of Jonah. So let's get down to the details. We're looking at chapter one, this week, and we're going to look at the call of Jonah. What happens in the verse, first two verses, the call of Jonah? Well, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, this is the call of God that comes toward Jonah, and uh, he is told simply to get up and get out. This is the only time in the Old Testament where you see a missionary from, a, you know, from the nation of Israel, going to a foreign nation. There were other prophets of the Lord who spoke out against the nations, but in their own land. Here is the only known case that I know of that a prophet from the nation of Israel was discharged, commissioned to go into another land and bring the news that God wanted them to hear. And this case was judgment. Why was it judgment? because of the wickedness that had come up before me. This underscores the fact that God looks at the nations of the world, the people of the world, and he's very familiar with what's going on. And he's not happy, the, he's not happy with the wicked, the scripture says, every day. The wicked are like the sea that are troubled, tossed about. God is not satisfied with how the world's going. It's not a diverse world as uh, others would like to make you think, that everybody's okay. Way back in the 60s, I think it was, or, the 50s, too young for me, I'm sure. But uh, there was a book called I'm Okay, You're Okay. That was a classic. Some of you young people don't even know what I'm talking about. But it was a book on psychology. And the underlying premise is, hey, you live your life the way you want to live it. You live your life the way you want to live it. And we're all okay. Well, if you applied that 
mentality to this, Jonah would have no message to bring to the Ninevites. God said, no, what the Ninevites were guilty of was wickedness, and they're on record in even secular society, secular records of the immense brutality that was exhibited by that nation. They were evil people, they were brutal, and God said their wickedness has come up before him. <clears throat> God sees the wickedness, not just of nations, but he sees the wickedness of individuals. And he wants his people to speak out against it. Now, that's what we're told, not told not to do in our society these days. But God says in his word that there is a responsibility to do so. And so he is telling Jonah here, arise, go to Nineveh, verse 2, that great city and cry out against it. <clears throat> now, how was Nineveh great? It's described here as a great city. It's so one of many greats. There's a great city in verse 4. There's a great wind. There's a great tempest in verse 12. There's all these greats in the book of Jonah. And one of these, the first one, is a great city. Now, how are they great? Well, uh, if you just look over real quickly into chapter 3, it says in verse 3 that uh, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. <clears throat> this is probably the biggest city in the world at that time, the known world at that time. Cities filled with cultural items, museums in our day, sports arenas, shops, parks, cultural things, great city, large, New York City. Now, you know, we're, we're, not, we're in the shadow of New York City here in this part of the country. And people look at it and say, it's a great city, lots of things to do there. God looks at it and he says, hey, you know, all those pictures that you have, you know, you go into the dentist's office, you see a beautiful picture in New York City at night with all the lights on the skyscrapers. And you say, oh, it looks so beautiful. Come down to the day, get down to street level and you see all the mess. It's so opposite from God's perspective. He looks at the wickedness and he says, no, this is actually killing you and you don't realize it. The things that you're involved with is actually you're robbing yourself of the joy of what life was intended to be with my guidance and my direction. And that's why God says he is a jealous God. He hates to see people going the course of this world, Philipp, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, guided by his artful treachery, speaking about the devil, hurrying on to endless pain, like the song says, and following the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air of the devil, who takes people down his garden path and says, follow me and you'll have the best life possible. And a road that leads to nowhere. Years ago, we were in Alaska, Juneau, Alaska, on a trip that we were doing. And our guide said to us, now this is Juneau, Alaska, a beautiful place. He says, the roads are really well paved. Everything is nice here. The only thing, the roads led to nowhere. The only way to come into Juno is either by air or by sea ship, you know, the cruise liners. You get on the roads and the roads look beautiful, but they dead end into the woods because there's no way to get off that area. And so Juno has all these beautiful roads that lead to nowhere. And in this world, there's lots of roads that look good and they're well paved and they're wonderful to drive on, but they lead nowhere. That's exactly the problem. With this world they think they're going for a great joy ride and it terminates in a place that has no hope to it at all and so the call of jonah was like the call of the great commission matthew chapter 28 the lord said go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and so we should be doing that telling the people jonah was told arise go to Nineveh, of that great city and cried against it and it was not really great it was great in size, it was great in grandeur, it was cultural, sure, but it was brutal and there was wickedness that characterized that city. Second thing that we see here is the course of Jonah, the course of Jonah. And look with me now when it says in verses three, it says, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of of the Lord. He hears this direction from the Lord. How did it come? You know, 
but did it come audibly? We don't know. Did it come through his inward thoughts, his ideas, whatever? We don't know exactly. But all we know is God said, get up and get out. And Jonah said, nope, I'm going to catch a boat going the opposite direction. And in, an, in a clear, evident, disobedient way, blatantly disobedient, Jonah hops on the boat and goes the opposite way. You know, anytime you run from the Lord, you'll always find something to help you do that. And you can't look at it and say, well, this was meant to be. I guess I'm doing the right thing. You, disobedience will always find some contrary way to run away from the things of the Lord. And so I hope that here this morning, and you're here in a congregation to hear the preaching of the word. So I don't get the sense that anybody's running away, but maybe there's a struggle in your inward life. And God is telling you to do something. And you say, no, I don't want to do that. And God says, no, you need to do that. I'm telling you to do that. Maybe there's a struggle there. Now, it might not be as obvious as it was with Jonah, who hopped on the boat going to Spain to get away from the presence of the Lord, because no one can go away from the presence of the Lord. We're told that in various scriptures. Let me see if I have that scripture here before us. This is Psalm 139, and verses 7 through 12. This is David speaking. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. And that's David in a positive way. Say, I can't get away from the presence of God. And yet Jonah here is trying to run from the presence of the Lord. Well, inevitably, whenever you do that, the path is downhill, isn't it? Notice what we read here in verse 3. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. So he goes from where he is down to the seaport to hop on a boat. And it's naturally down geographically. And he pays the fare and he goes down into the boat. Then look at verse five. The mariners were afraid. Every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the earth. And then in chapter two, there's another verse in verse six, chapter two, verse six. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. Down, 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 down. When our own selfish desires take over. And we're turning a deaf ear to the spirit of God and the direction, the clear direction of the Lord. The path, the course is inevitably downhill. And that's what happened here with Jonah. Now, unfortunately, you have me for the next three weeks. And uh, I say that tongue in cheek, but the idea is that we're going to take a look at what happens here with Jonah as we go through this whole event each week going through one of these chapters. We'll pick this up here next week. But let me really impress upon the audience here this morning. God told Jonah to do something. And Jonah says, I don't want to do that. Why didn't he want to do that? Maybe he had something against those Ninevites. They're bitter enemies of God's people. Maybe he was resentful because he had a great ministry early on as a young person. And nothing happened. He didn't get up there and get a free Bible or you know, some sort of prize for his prophecy. And maybe he got forgotten. And he said, you know, I was, you know, I was used of the Lord back then. I'm not used that much of the Lord right now. I don't want to go. Maybe he was resentful. What was the reason why Jonah didn't go to the Ninevites? Maybe he was fearful that he would get hurt. There's a whole bunch of reasons. But whatever it was, God wanted him to go ahead. And he didn't want to go. And maybe God is speaking to you about something that he wants you to do. And you're digging your heels in and saying, Lord, I don't want to do that. And the Lord says, no, I'm asking you to. And you say, well, that's okay. I have other things to do. I want to go in this direction, just like Jonah. Maybe the Lord is speaking to you about that too. And we'll continue this account next week. And look at what happens as he prays all through this. But all these events taking place, and I want to encourage you to read through the book of Jonah. Be acquainted with it so 
these words don't drop on the ground. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again for these very practical lessons that come to us from the prophecy of Jonah. We pray, Lord, through your Holy Spirit that you speak to our hearts about these important truths, these important lessons that we all need to heed, that we would pay attention to, and that we would learn so that our walk and our joy of serving you would be manifest and evident in our lives. We ask these things, giving thanks in our Savior's name. Amen.